The popular conception of the police state, derived mainly from works of science fiction, revolves heavily around the deployment of exotic technologies for keeping the populace firmly under the thumb of an authoritarian government. Winston Smith and the characters of 1984 were surveilled by the omnipresent telescreens. The inhabitants of the brave new world were controlled by their government-administered soma drugs and hypnopedia indoctrination. Enemy of the state introduced the viewer to worldwide telephone and satellite surveillance. Philip K. Dick's Minority Report had its robotic tracking bugs. And all manner of science fiction has featured pain devices that caused the protagonist to double over in pain at the click of a button. Perhaps it's the frequency with which these devices are presented to us in fictionalized form that prevents many from noticing that this technology is not the stuff of sci-fi fantasy, but increasingly a part of our everyday lives. Under the Future Attribute Screening Technologies, or FAST program, the Department of Homeland Security is developing innovative physiological and behavioral screening technologies to streamline the screening process at security checkpoints. From the outside, the ZBV looks like an ordinary delivery van, allowing it to blend in to urban and other landscapes. Yet, as it passes by cars, trucks, containers, and other objects, its unparalleled X-ray screening system provides photo-like images, detecting explosives, weapons, contraband, and stowaways. Neighbors accustomed to livestock and wide open land had no idea what to make of all this. Black trucks, satellite dishes, a radar swirling, and a portable launch pad with something covered up. At the entrance to this Waller County Ranch was a Houston police roadblock, checking all the dignitaries arriving for this secret test. Their invitation spelled out, no media allowed. We tried to ask this HPD lieutenant on his way back out. They'll be coming out here in a minute. They all gathered around the launch pad, big shots with police departments from all over the Houston area. And now, the show they came for, the test you were not supposed to see. It's an unmanned drone aircraft. HPD, the Federal Department of Homeland Security, and other invited guests all watching to see how this drone could be used for police work in and around Houston. Morris has a full facial recognition system, Iris technology recognition, and then fingerprint matching capabilities, all in the field and done from a common iPhone. It's new. It looks harmless enough, right? Well, but it could light up like a Roman candle. Check that out. It's a crowd buster, a non-lethal way to take the fight out of an angry crowd. Watch it in action. <laughs> okay, well, these are volunteers, we hope, and you and I call it a heat ray. The Army calls it an active denial system. Millimeter waves that make you feel like your skin is on fire. Wow. One worrying aspect of the deployment of this technology is the way it's been introduced into our life in stages, so that no particular device seems like the dawning of an era of techno-dictatorship. This applies especially to the technology of pain compliance in policing and law enforcement. Since the days when a billy club and handcuffs were the policeman's most sophisticated technology, techniques such as headlocks, chokeholds, and even the breaking of bones have been used to force unwilling citizens into compliance. But the modern era of policing began with the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, appointed by President Johnson in the wake of the 1967 race riots to discover what could be done to maintain public order. In addition to recommending greater police surveillance as a solution to the riots, and laying the foundations for what later became Operation Garden Plot, the U.S. government's early plan for implementing martial law and rounding up dissenting Americans, the commission, headed by Governor Otto Kerner Jr. of Illinois, called for the development of a new arsenal of non-lethal weapons to aid law enforcement in subduing unruly rioters. According to the report, weapons which are designed to destroy, not to control, have no place in densely populated urban communities. Within a year of the release of the Commission's findings, Jack Cover, a NASA researcher, began development on the Taser, which was completed in 1974, although not widely adopted by police departments until the last decade. 
Since its inception as a standard police implement, the Taser has courted controversy, with critics blaming the weapon for as many as 515 American deaths since 2001. It has also been denounced by the United Nations Committee Against Torture, Amnesty International, and other organizations as a potential weapon of torture. But the Taser manufacturer insists that the device is a safe and effective tool for law enforcement. Taser CEO Rick Smith has claimed that the Taser has in fact been responsible for saving 75,000 lives. And Taser Chairman Tom Smith insists, With the Taser, the intent is not to inflict pain, it's to end the confrontation. When it's over, it's over. A taser, taser should only be used when a person cannot physically be taken into custody. I hardly think this 10-year-old girl could not be contained. I think that's what a lot of people are thinking. You're trying to tell me a cop couldn't restrain a 10-year-old without using a taser? Mike, I have to agree with that. Uh, I've got some issues with this. Uh, I, I believe, and what I'm troubled about, is that the officer actually asked the mother if he can taser her, which leads me to believe he was questioning his own judgment. Also, are you a member, are you a member of Stolen Rooms, College, Bush? Were you in the same secret society? Well, that's all right. Let me answer his question. Mace's aunt tells us he's undergoing major surgery for a broken back and a broke off heel. But while he was lying on the ground, she wonders why Ozark police tased him up to 19 times. And I'm not an officer, but I don't see the reason for tasing the somebody that's laying there with a broken back. I don't consider that a threat. The defendant gets wheeled out. He's in a wheelchair because he's injured, right? Well, there he goes on the attack, trying to kick an officer. They ended up using a taser to try to subdue him. Uh, actually, taser the officer at the same time, as you can see. Now, the use of tasers is being considered in other settings, including airplanes where it is now being proposed that all passengers be fitted with electronic taser bracelets capable of delivering incapacitating electric shocks to passengers suspected of being hijackers. It starts here, when passengers are issued their tickets. At that time, they can also be fitted with a special electronic ID bracelet that they will wear until they disembark the flight at their destination. These electronic coated bracelets will make traveling much more convenient for the public. It will replace the need to carry a ticket by containing all pertinent passenger information. In addition, the bracelet could permit tracking of the passenger through the terminal, including carry-on luggage. Checked luggage can be coded to match the bracelet to ensure no tampering or diversions. By further equipping each bracelet with EMD technology, the bracelets will allow crew members using radio frequency transmitters to quickly and effectively subdue hijackers. The electromuscular disruption signal overrides the attacker's central nervous system and will render even the most elite and aggressive terrorist completely immobile for several minutes. This will allow the crew to subdue and handcuff that individual. This development as much as it may seem like science fiction fantasy at first glance, will come as no surprise to those who have long recognized that airports are fast becoming the front line of the police state, a testing ground for new police state technology and invasive, humiliating searches, all done in the name of passenger safety. Perhaps the most terrifying prospect in the rise of this police state is not merely that the police, TSA, and law enforcement agents the government employs to implement these measures are not adequately trained on the issues at stake or the proper deployment of the technologies they are using, but that they are being actively recruited and encouraged to be as aggressive as possible in dealing with the public and aided in doing so by the federal government, the courts, and the upper ranks of their own departments. In 2000, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals ruled it acceptable for police departments to discriminate against potential recruits for having too high an IQ. In 2005, records were revealed showing that the Army was increasingly granting waivers to ex-convicts in order to meet recruiting quotas. In 2003, 
The Department of Homeland Security's Inspector General announced a probe into the TSA's hiring practices after it was found that dozens of their screeners had criminal records. Yet in 2010, the issue had still not been resolved, with no clear answers as to how the DHS had amended its hiring practices, if at all, and whether or not rapists and felons were still in charge of delivering the TSA's new invasive pat-downs. After recruitment, police, firefighters, military, TSA, and others are subjected to internal propaganda, demonizing all sorts of everyday actions as potential terrorist threats, and even portraying the founding fathers of the U.S. as terrorists themselves. Suspicious surveillance activity may include someone recording or monitoring activities, drawing diagrams, making notes, using vision-enhancing devices, acquiring floor plans or blueprints or showing interest in the security and access points to facilities. Any of these surveillance methods may be a sign that something isn't right and you should report it to the kayak. There are laws on the books now that characterize who might be a terrorist. Someone missing fingers on their hands is a suspect, according to the Department of Justice. Someone who has guns, someone who has ammunition that is weatherproofed, someone who has more than seven days of food in their house can be considered a potential terrorist. If you are suspected by these activities, do you want to have the government have the ability to send you to Guantanamo Bay for indefinite detention? Who was the first terrorist organization in the United States? <clears throat> Who? Tommy Fox. Tommy You mean Thomas Jefferson? Oh, yeah. You mean uh, George Washington? Oh, yeah. Paul Revere? Yeah. Yeah. These guys right here, let me ask you something. Did they try to scare people? <laughs> oh, yeah. They tried to intimidate the British. Did they try to, did they use acts of violence? Your founding fathers, my founding fathers, were involved in acts of terrorism against British officials because they systematically had British officials assassinate, assassinate. As horrifying as this might be, there is the tendency to portray these developments as a nightmare, something that is happening around us over which we as individuals have no control. And yet, it is our tax dollars that fund the development of this technology. It is our votes that elect the officials who hand the technology to the police, the TSA, the NSA, the National Guard, and all of the other agencies that, divided, make up the compartmentalized pieces of this control grid. And it is our compliance that allows the state to function. All it requires is for enough citizens to become informed, educated, and mobilized for the police state to be halted in its tracks. 17-year-old honor student Kalia Fetche was arrested, forcibly grabbed, and unconstitutionally searched and held at a police station house in Newark, New Jersey by Newark police officers Naomi Maloon and Lloyd Thomas. Her crime? She was filming officers who were responding to a man who collapsed on a city bus. She was in public, filming on-duty police officers who were in public, all of which is protected by the First Amendment. And the police would have none of it. What's wrong with these cops? Do they simply arrest people because they can? Sadly, the answer is yes, and because we let them get away with it. It's time we stand up to police officers who don't understand the laws they were sworn to protect. The charges against Kalia were dropped. Now it's time for the feds to file charges against these Newark cops. This little thing is a weapon against tyranny. It is. It absolutely is. And I think we're, we should, I mean, not only should we sort of celebrate that, that technology, that we have this huge weapon against tyranny in our pockets, but I, we need to make sure that the laws protect the way we use it and that uh, ensure that we can continue to use it that way. What's up? Are you an American citizen? Are you a U.S. citizen? Are you an American citizen? Yes, sir. Do you have an ID on you? No, sir. Do you got an ID? Let me see your ID. I had to make sure you're an American citizen. Are you both U.S. citizens? You got an ID on you? Do you? Where have you been today? Go ahead and go, sir. Where are you heading to? Go ahead. Where are you heading to? A role reversal of sorts in Oregon. A civilian gave a police officer a parking ticket. Do you see police park right there a lot? Oh, yeah, it happens fairly often, yeah. The officer allegedly parked in a no parking zone while he went inside a restaurant to pick up his dinner. A local patron didn't like what he saw, so he wrote him up with a citizen's citation. It worked. 
Now the officer has to go to court. Leave these people alone. They're U.S. citizens. U.S. citizens. U.S. citizens. U.S. It does not make you want to do this to them. It doesn't. Stop hurting these people, man. Why y'all do this to our people? I've been to Iraq 14 months for my people. You come over here and hurt them. They don't have guns. They don't have guns. They don't. Why are you hurting these people? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. How do you sleep at night? There is no honor in this. There is no honor in this. There is no honor in this, man. This video is brought to you by the subscribers of BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information on this and other topics, please go to BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information and commentary from James Corbett, please go to CorbettReport.com.